I am going to go ahead and call this meeting to order at 6.02. We do indeed have a quorum. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, meeting purpose, these are just a few. We're gonna approve the annual agenda, hopefully, unless, unless people have notes. Um, look at our ENDS policy, first read, and talk about the board vacancy. Again, lots of other stuff going on, but those are some biggies. Um, to review and accept the agenda, I do have uh, an addition, just one additional item to add to the agenda. Other things um, that have come up fit on other, under. He belongs, Ryan said he could. Ryan goes under okay. the ownership linkage plan. Um, so there's just one to add under the consent agenda. It is a um, reserve fund request from Nika Oaks of RCC. Um It's both in the stapled packet and then separately also, thank you Kyle for doing that. Um, I believe the third, yes, the third mm -hmm. document in the separate paper clipped. Um, I haven't done, I've only done one of those. See, no, that's your um, so could I have, um, a, I'll entertain a motion to add that item to the agenda. So moved. So thank, moved. You, thank you, Emil. Thank you, Ryan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions. Great. Thank you. It has been added. <coughs> um, any other concerns, questions, comments about the agenda? before we move into it. Great, thank you. Um, at this time, uh, doing a quick scan, we do have public here. We're gonna move into the public comment section. Um, I'll just read a quick preamble. The board welcomes comments, but is not able to take action on them other than to direct the public to the appropriate staff member or to the complaint procedure. Comments are limited to three minutes per seat speaker. Time may not be ceded to another speaker. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board, on the staff, or in the public. Please raise your hand and wait to speak until you are called on by myself. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared. You can certainly express agreement with those comments. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone. Shouting and profanity are prohibited. As the board chair, I will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting. And with that, I open the floor for public comment. <laughs> I see no one online. I see no hands in the crowded audience. Um, so with that, five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to close public comment. Six oh five. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close it. Um, moving on, uh, Kate's resignation, which of course she gave verbally um, at our last meeting, our July meeting, also. Um, uh, uh, submitted it in writing, which was included in the packet electronically. Um, from that, uh, Michael, I believe, put together the posting. Thank you for that. Um, sent to the Herald, correct? Correct. Yes. And of course to the clerk uh, in Braintree and also posted on Front Porch Forum. Um, and we have an interested party. One one interested party unless anything came in in the past nothing else has come in minutes well on one hand that sure does make it easy <laughs> um this is not by statute um this is <clears throat> not a, an application process this is a kind of we create a process that works for us. Um, we can talk to them. We can choose to ask them to come to a meeting where we can ask questions. We can rely solely on what was sent. Um, How long do we hi wait? Hi, Heather. How long do we wait for anyone else to be? 
Hello, thank you. I had trouble finding the link. I'll be careful to make sure we make it more easy to find in the future. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, we need to appoint someone within 30 days. So, the, yeah, the two things that you're looking at with the, with the statute is you, the select board for the town in which she represents may consult with you, and your job is to appoint someone within 30 days. I don't think I've ever managed to appoint someone within 30 days. This is the closest that I think I could have come to seeing that actually happen. But we well, have. Yeah, and well, an argument could be made twice when the, the countdown kind of started. I mean, it could be when she, um, the written when the written, yeah, yep. came in. So we do have more time to wait. However, we would not meet again in time for that 30-day marker. We could always call a special meeting if there were two candidates and we wanted to speak to both of them. Um, or we could make the call tonight. That's our call. It feels odd um, hiring the person without having met them, but uh, at the same time, her resume seems really great and her letter was fantastic, so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, right, I mean, this is someone <coughs> who we appoint, I mean, we're not hiring, we appoint to represent the people of Braintree, and then it's only th through the election in March, right. in which, at which point he or she um, could choose to run again, and I suppose choose not to. Uh, Sam, you went through this. I did. Right? And there were, is there one other candidate? He, the, with Sam's, there were two other candidates. There were two uh, other candidates. Two other candidates to begin with, and then I think somebody withdrew. Can't yeah, yeah. With yeah. Withdrew. Well, and then we Ronnie, spoke with two. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, I, but I, I felt like we <coughs> did that over the course of two meetings. Your appointment. Yeah. It was within 30 days. Mm -hmm. We had a special meeting to oh, that, just. Oh, that's right. Special meeting. Um, right. To, to meet with you three. Two. Excuse me. <clears throat> Electronically. Um, so, other thoughts, other hesitations, or <clears throat> enthusiasm? I mean, it would be nice to hear this person uh, speak the way Sam and uh, the other people did. That was helpful. Mm -hmm. Is is there a world in which we would speak to someone, the only candidate for a vacant seat, and then say, "Sorry, no, no thanks." I don't think so. I don't think so. I Interesting point. Yeah. I, right. I mean, that does raise the question of. Could there be a scenario where they, they just come off as just so offensive or something like that that we wouldn't hire them? But I just don't see that happening with this person. And they could win in a regular election also. So, right. I mean, I didn't submit anything. I just, you know, <clears throat> went through the election process. That's so. true. Yeah, that's true. You folks didn't meet me, and I ran on post. So. <clears throat> so while I totally understand the the want of um, speaking to someone in person. Um, I am of the mind that we have someone uh, with interest and perks of having a background in education. Um, yeah, so children in the district, so. And has children in the district. Yeah. Uh, how did Rachel hear about this? Did anyone recommend her? Did I she did. have a connection to anyone on the board? Yeah, okay. I know Rachel. Um, and I believe Rachel's spouse is a teacher, so she would be someone who could not sit on a, because of a conflict of interest, wouldn't be able to sit on a teacher uh, negotiation salary negotiation mm -hmm. or a teacher contract negotiation. And that may come up um, having to do with, which would, you know, sh she may need to self recuse from some executive session personnel issues like that. Um, but. We have someone else in that we know, we position, know so <laughs> it's certainly not a not a deal breaker. 
Um, I guess the only question is how much longer would we wait to see if any other applicants come in? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we follow the statute at 30 day, we're at it, so. That's, Katja did resign our last meeting, so yeah, you're right about that. The letter was submitted on July 31st. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would also mean posting things again. I mean, I, I we're not paying for the ad to appear many times. Mm -hmm. um, so it would take some, two oh, times. How long ago was the ad? Today. Uh, the ad was out today. Oh. So then we need to get to Yeah, mm -hmm. we do. Didn't we have it last Monday? Yeah. It comes up. It's the ad in last week's too. Yeah. Just this week. Okay. So then we give it another. Uh, yeah, we don't want to week. advertise on Thursday if we right. Ready. Right. Right. So the paper comes so out we'll tomorrow. So we need a special meeting. Yep. Yeah. So we'll do a special meeting. So it comes out tomorrow. Um, can people? Is it for two weeks? You said, or just one week? Yeah, two weeks, but we could always pull it. So I'd like to propose that we schedule a special meeting for next week right now. Sure. If people could look at their schedules. Next week. You don't want to do... The first week of school? No, I don't. <laughs> What's the first week of school? Twenty six week, week of school. Yeah. Okay. And then it's Labor Day. And then we're well, then we're, out, then we're outside the 30-day. 30, 30 right. Okay. Uh, so that means we would pull the ad from 22nd. Okay. Yeah, cool. I can do... Any evening. I think it should be later in the week if, we're, if people are going to get this notification on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And have a little bit of time to get a letter of interest in. I think it should be sure. later in the week. How about so the 22nd? Right. Thursday? Yeah. 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 Um, it can be fully <laughs> remote. You know, let's plan on doing that. If someone would rather be in person, I'm happy to be there to ma woman the uh, electronics. Um, if we make it at the central office, I'll be at the central office to man it, and then nobody has to come in special for it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so, great. Let's warn it that we're going to have a special meeting next Thursday. Um, and if people would like me to post again uh, in Front Porch Forum and include that, um, that it, it, it closes Wednesday. End of day Wednesday. End of business day Wednesday. 6, 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. on the meeting Thursday. Sure. Mm -hmm. Works for me. Yeah. Well, Great. Good. Sounds like we'll have a quorum. Yeah? Yeah? Awesome. All these are. What's that? I'll probably be there. Great. <laughs> you know, give it some thought. Do we want to reach out to Rachel and invite her? Absolutely. That would be great. And I will do that. Do you have Thank a contact you. info? Oh, yeah, we got our email address. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's it. <laughs> Um, speaking of also to do with Katya's resignation, she does sit on two subcommittees, two sitting subcommittees. Um, one of them is ownership linkage, mm -hmm. right? She's not on ends. She's on ownership linkage. Right. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. Um, which an argument could be made either way that it needs replacement. There's no need. Um, the other is the support staff negotiation committee. Um, so. I would it prefer three people the same yeah. 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 yeah, this is all the items that came in that it has yeah. those in it as well. Yeah. Um, I think maybe we should wait until the new board member. What? Oh. Uh, is there a conflict of interest? Well, we don't know who the board member is, so. Right, there mind. could be. Um, I think to say, yeah, there could be, if that's who it turns out to be. Um, so is there someone who is not on the support staff negotiation committee 
I'm not, but I'm on the other. You're on the, with me, the, yeah, yeah, the professional so staff. I don't think is there that someone works. who is not on either at the moment who could join support? I think I'm on it. I believe you are as well. You just sent me that list. <clears throat> Pardon me. Here we go. Support staff Katya, Ryan, and Rachel. Uh, I am. Indeed, you I are. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome. <laughs> <That's what this laughs> Congratulations. Come on in the water. Um, so, who's on professional? So, Sam and Anne are the two people who right now do not sit on a negotiating committee. That's a quick process of elimination. Good job. Yeah, I don't know that I should be on the sports staff one. Right. I mean, she no longer works in the district, but it's a little close to home. Yeah. Yeah. That's understandable. That's fair. Yeah. So I'd have to do a switcheroo with someone. Wait, but why are we doing this? Katya was on the supporting, oh, the okay. support staff negotiating. Yeah, I d I'd be willing to do that again. Great. Sorry. Thank you, Anne. Sorry. So Anne will be joining the support staff negotiating committee. Thanks again. Um, the other committee she belongs to is the ownership linkage committee with Ryan and Sam. Um, is anyone interested in joining that one? This is the easy I think one. This, I think this is where, this is where like, the new board member might, might be interested. Great. Yeah. So she's, we'll leave that vacant for so now. She's clearly so articulate and good at communications that she'd be a shoot. Well, and we may have someone else yes, who might also well. be interested. Yes. Um, so great. So we'll leave that vacant for now. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for pointing We can out. hold down the fort until then. You um, are. <laughs> so <laughs> moving on, thank you all for working through that with me. With, effort, with us, um, ownership linkage plan. So, Ryan sent uh, a letter today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This afternoon, um, I quickly when in receiving that letter, I quickly uh, looked through past minutes because I wanted to refresh myself as to where we were. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't present at the meeting where this um, topic came up. Um, but I wonder, this is somewhat selfish, but I wonder if because I wasn't present at that time, before we look at the actual letter itself, if we could just talk um, more generally about this Absolutely. proposal. Yeah, so I think uh, if it was either the last meeting or the one before it, uh, we were encouraged by a student named Ryan to have some kind of student representation on the board uh, and this would be a non-voting position or appointment I suppose um, and Heather maybe you can speak more to Ryan's proposal uh, if I'm not covering everything but the idea was that this would improve equity uh, he was his senior project was about equity in education and creating more equitable experience for students and one of his action items for us uh, was to get some student representation on the board uh, so I think I don't remember if we had agreed to do it there was I don't, no vote there was no vote to do it okay mm -hmm. but we had general we had discussed uh, potentially doing it I don't think we we had come up with any action item so um, if we did decide to do it this is a letter that we could send out to the community um, I don't you know beyond that we don't really have a plan I think that this is something that the whole board has to discuss of whether or not it'd be wise to have uh, student representation on the board uh, but you know Ryan did make a very strong case for it and uh, I think it's something we need to discuss before we move forward with it but this is simply a, a letter that we can send out to the community if we decide to do so based on my notes from the previous meetings great um, so Heather did you want to jump in before I start babbling only to say thank you to Ryan for drafting this uh, lovely communication um, and to validate 
the work that Ryan did and uh, to encourage the board to consider, uh, strongly uh, recommend, I strongly recommend, and so does the um, Vermont uh, School Board Association to consider this as a uh, best practice. Okay. Um, so I do have a lot of thoughts on this topic. Um, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. And again, I was not um, present when it first came up. So I wonder if others um, have thoughts to share. I mean, I think having students involved in any process is wonderful. Um, my takeaway from that meeting was that there was going to be sort of like how would we do that? Like mm -hmm. next steps would be presented. So it's a wonder. It's a very well written letter. Um, but I also, and again, I'm so new to policy governance. So forgive me. But when I think about policy governance and then this idea of a student, like what does that look like? And yep. Yeah. How would that work? And is that something that ownership linkage talked about or discussed since? We did not. Uh, you know, I think based on Ryan's proposal, it really would just look like a student attending our meetings, having some time cut out for them to give us any insight that they feel necessary, uh, to comment on anything that we're discussing. I'm not sure about, again, policy governance in terms of their access to our vote I know they cannot vote would they be in the room when we vote will they hear how we vote uh, I'm not sure how that would work but well it's a public meeting I mean they certainly couldn't yeah. be an executive session right that's what I'm yeah. that's but what I mean is can, can, would they be in there probably not no um, yeah, no. so beyond that I think um, really it's just an opportunity for a student to have some time carved out to comment our, on our agenda or to give us any insight that they deem necessary. So if I, so remembering back to this meeting, this is two meetings ago, we deliberated about this for a fair amount of time. I think the general consensus was that it was a good idea. There was some nuts and bolts around the mechanics mm -hmm. of it in the election process. Like how do we, you know, there was some concerns spoken about a uh, popularity contest versus right. the responsibility as a student representative um, and I th think we kind of walked away from the conversation saying all right this needs some ironing and some thinking about and I think that's when we kind of thought that that would be an ownership linkage uh, committee activity and I think Kasha was in agreement that that would be an ownership linkage activity at the time. I, you know, we may be getting the cart in front of the horse a little oh, bit with the letter, with yeah. the letter, but I think it's you know good progress. I definitely don't think I definitely think we shouldn't move forward without getting all of the thoughts on the table, especially yours, considering that you weren't at that meeting. So, thank you. Um, Heather, you raised your hand. I would like to recommend that we invite Lisa Floyd to the next meeting to present um, how they might roll out the um, choice process because she definitely will have some thoughts on what would be equitable and how we might do that within a way that would seem really good to the community. So I wanted to recommend that. Thank you. I think that's another cart getting in front of the horse um, because the election process, I think, is further down the road than than us. Um, yeah. Since this is a VSBA best practices, there must be um, some guidance on how this is done in other board situations where policy governance is the is the practice. Um, do we have any information about that? About how other boards that are using policy governance integrate students? 
or any, or does anybody know where we could get that information? Especially if this is well, a we BSBA. Can certainly contact if this is a BSBA. Um, yes, Ann and I attended. A, and do you recall? I believe the way they said they did it is they had students submit essays, and the essays were blind, and they chose. Oh, those. I don't mean. I don't mean the. I don't mean the. Sorry, Heather. I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, no, that's not the election process. Oh. But like, what the function okay. of the student on the right. board. Like, how the student integrates um, in the board. Do they get, you they're, know, do they do anything? Their do structure, they, their function, right. their their responsibility, their limitations, et cetera. If I, as I've observed it, typically they have a report to the board, um, a student report to the board, which is brief. And then they weigh in on anything that might impact student um, experience, um, but do not vote. So they have a seat at the table, but not, they don't vote. Appreciate that as a board that's part of what you're deciding you're figuring out what would the what would the value of having the student be what would you specifically be looking for by adding another seat to the table whether voting or not uh, and so I appreciate that you're having a conversation right now that's sort of fleshing that out and getting really clear about it rather than bringing some high school student in and saying welcome to the board with no parameters. You don't so, want to waste anybody's time. Yeah. You know, what are the benefits? What are the burdens? Both for us, both for the students. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I can look at what other uh, boards have done with this, but I do anticipate that it's going to be exactly as Heather said in terms of this student would have a uh, X amount of time, you know, per meeting to report to the board. And if we do go into a vote for anything, that they have an opportunity to have an additional advisory moment where they give us some kind of insight uh, where they think how we should vote, maybe. So um, here are my somewhat jumbled thoughts. We um, invite principals to do this very thing, give a report what's going on in their uh, lane, in their neck of the woods. Um, they don't have a seat at the table. They don't have time at every meeting. Um, and I think it's a slippery slope to give one facet of the ownership a seat at the table and carved time on every agenda. Um, it's hard for me to figure out how to voice my thoughts because it's hard to be the one that sounds like they're opposed to a student having a seat at the table mm -hmm. or having a voice in the group. Um, and so I need to say that and acknowledge it, mm -hmm. but that's very hard for me and I assume for anyone else. That being said, um, right, I said slippery slope. That's, that's where I'm pretty firmly seated right mm -hmm. now. Um, because I also feel like there's an opportunity here to come up with a way for students to be involved and then report back to the board, hey, this is what it is for the student ownership and for them to own <laughs> that voice. Um, but in my experience here, I don't see and, and this is a new concept for me, so I'm still fleshing it out in my head, but I'm not seeing benefits outweighing my concerns. You bring up a great point in that, you know, what, how is this different than having a student come weekly and just engage in public comment? Monthly, but yeah. Or, sorry, yes. <laughs> I mean, they could come weekly. But my question still stands, you know, is, is this is there really any fundamental material difference to having a student who could just be engaged right now? They, a student could be coming every month to these meetings and engaging in public comment to give essentially a report. Um, they don't, you know, probably because no one has told them that that is an opportunity. But I think you're, you're spot on here that the, we already kind of have an opportunity for someone to do this. Well, and I think that much like with the principals, I think there is value in saying to students, 
we we want to have you at the table as your own agenda item. We're going to mm -hmm. carve out some time, quarterly, trimesterally, whatever um, we decide, and engage with us. Public comment we can't engage in, right? So if we, like with mm. the principals, you come, you give a report, or you say, hey, this is what's going. It doesn't have to be formal. That can be stress inducing, um, but it gives the opportunity for a reciprocal, you know, a give and take. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not report to us because we're just another That's authority true. figure. But hey, you know, present something that, let's face it, we may or may not be, we're not operational, you know? We might even end up saying, this sounds like something that maybe should go to the cabinet. Heather, um, I feel like out of all of us, you maybe see the value in this um, more so. Do you have anything to say <laughs> in favor of this that maybe might assuage some fears here or uh, might help us see the value in, in having a, a student representative on the board itself? I want to say I respect and value what Hannah has said and remind the board that the principals never came to public comment. It wasn't until they were invited to speak to the board that they came. And they came with bells on and happy to present and with joy in their hearts to tell you both um, the things that were going well and the things they wanted help with. And um, from what I've heard, from other superintendents and other school board members across the state, having students invited in the same way has incredible value because you're teaching civic responsibility, you're teaching the idea of elected office, the idea of like, I represent, right? And I have a, a responsibility to collect information from my stakeholders and turn it forward to the board. And so it's more than just saying you're, you know, so I don't want to be the only voice advocating for this. Um, so whatever the board decides, as long as we're moving more toward welcoming student voice, I'm thrilled. And I want to say um, the idea of promoting civic responsibility and, and saying to a student, you know, this is work for you There'll be a small stipend for you to do this work, collect data, synchronize data, present it to the board, might have value. And I wonder if this is um, something, this isn't my idea, someone else gave it to me, but what about a small committee of students that does this work and comes in at, uh, uh, on a, on on a thank you, like we have the principals do, um, with yeah. it just carved out as student voice, and they can have, you know, what is our most, what, 10, 15 minutes, something like that, and with room for, like with the principals, interaction. If we work with the principals to incorporate student voice into the information that they're bringing, they're specifically bringing information about what's happening in the schools and who better to share that with you than students that they're bringing with them right I guess that's the other part I have kind of been thinking about is that RUHS is only one of multiple schools in the district yes. and, um, <coughs> although I have a six-year-old who would love to come to this meeting <laughs> I can tell you it wouldn't be super Helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, as I, was for yourself. <laughs> as I was writing this, I, I you know was including the RUHS students. It's like, why not elementary school students? Right. But ultimately, like, I do think that this is something that well, older students are, would be interested in. And but that's just my bias. Um, but I think the idea of I like this idea that Michael's talking about is how is that incorporated in with how the principals are reporting because then. I mean, first of all, to be very honest, we meet, our meetings go beyond the time that most elementary school children are in bed. That's true. So um, nobody wants to wake up at 7 12 on a Thursday. 
Thursday morning after one of these meetings. Um, but I think that gets a wider voice, and I think there's a lot of, in general, boards are really trying to have more of a voice in the in the primary population that they serve on their board. Um, and so I think that's, you know, how do we, I'm getting very long-winded, I'm sorry, but how do we get a voice from RTCC, our elementary schools, and then there's also parent perspective. So then I also think about when you open the door to one thing, what other ownership components should also be having a voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably a great thing for this student or committee of students to do, right, is to go around and gather that information from the principals. I mean, it's, I don't want it to be something that we're doing and then handing to the student or something along those lines. Something you said stirred uh, an idea in my mind, too, that kind of counters the fear of a slippery slope. When I hear slippery slope, I'm immediately sympathetic to it in that, yes, there, if we're offering this kind of priority uh, carved out time to this one party of our ownership, why don't we do it to everybody, right? That's the, that's the slippery slope you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. And something you had said sparked for me is that because they are the primary stakeholders, right? They're the, the children we serve. They're also the children. And we are not accountable to them like we are other stakeholders or owners in that they don't get to vote for us or vote us out as individuals. So, and one of the things that Ryan had really stressed in his presentation to us when we met back at Braintree was that this is, there is an element of kind of inherent accountability here in that they are reporting to us, but it is a conversation. So I think for me that dispels a little bit of the slippery soap in that this is a unique party, a unique a unique owner and that there are children who we're otherwise not accountable to. Um, but also, as Heather, you said, this really grants them a sense of agency that they do not otherwise have as an owner, whereas other owners do have that sense of agency and that just by nature of being adults that they can come to these meetings, they have the material ability to do so, drive themselves to it. Uh, whereas if a student, a child has a seat here, then they are encouraged to speak there. They have that sense of agency that they otherwise may not be granted. Um, so that's my two cents in terms of it. Maybe the slippery slope is not as dire as we may think. Yeah, I, I do just one more thing, just looking for instance at this agenda. And I find myself looking for something in here, our revised ENDS policy, that a student would benefit and we would benefit from mm -hmm. a student's voice being a part of. And that just has to do with the kind of board that we are and how sure. we function, right? Or policy. Um, great learning experience, but not necessarily um, I'm, I'm going to start becoming repetitive. No, I, 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 I'm I, hearing you. I want There's... to make sure that the benefits outweigh any sort of, and, and I'm, I'm going to use the wrong words here, but it is a concern I have, wanting to look inclusive, almost, almost a superficial or political um, uh, attempt to look inclusive and welcoming and we want everyone's voice. But what is the best way to do that? And I, I honestly am not convinced that being a seated, non-voting member hmm. of a board that functions like this is the most productive way to do that. Because we don't just want to seem inclusive and that we're listening to all voices. 
we really want to do that. And I'm not convinced that this is the way to get there with students. Having them come and present, giving that voice and agency to them as an agenda, mem uh, agenda item, like we do the principals, that's giving them equal, they have equal access to us. They can put together their report or presentation based on the priorities they have and what they want us to know. And it also gives us an opportunity to speak directly to them on, a, on well, inherently there's always a hierarchy, right? We're old and tall. Um, but a, a, a sense of equity at the table and exchange of ideas. Is that sense of equity inherently, I don't know, um, lessened if they're just reporting to us and we do not have the um, compulsion to speak back, right? We, during public comment, we say, you can speak to us, but we don't have to speak to you, essentially. Um, by getting them here, though, is that element dispelled? And does that make it more equitable? I think you're talking about two different things. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think public I comment and agenda and an agenda item are, you know, like, okay. if it's on the agenda, it's, so it's, it's carved time. For, yeah. yeah, for dialogue. Okay, good. That helps. I think this is not, this is not a discussion that's going to end mm. now. It's going to end now because we're going to move on on this particular right. agenda, but it's not... All right. A dead topic. Well, in terms of action items, just for next time, I will see what um, I'll try to do my best to see what other boards do in terms of this, and um, try to give us a more of a sense of real world examples of this, and to see if there's more value. Thanks. Can I can I just say one thing? Because um, I remember this discussion and I, that. What you all are talking about is totally different from what I had in what I had in mind. So I'm like digesting as we're going along, because I, as a board member, don't come in and and report to the board. And if we're what we're doing is giving an opportunity for a student to operate as a board member, in some ways, they're they're learning they're doing what we're doing um, now and we talked about that a little bit at that meeting because this is the time for the board to get its work done and it's not just a time I mean when we have a report we don't have we don't want our meetings to go on until midnight the board, the report needs to be something related to an agenda item that has important information that's going to help the board make a decision. And remember, the board is looking more systemically and more big picture. I do think a student could benefit from experiencing what that's like, as well as learning that, oh, that's what a board is doing. It's not doing the day-to-day -day operations that maybe the cabinet is doing. And I know in previous uh, times, probably more pre-COVID, the cabinet had some students come in to be a part of the cabinet because that's where a lot of the decision-making that students are really more interested in and want a voice in. That's sort of understanding kind of the structure of the organization. We're way up here. The cabinet is right here and they're doing, they're making a lot of decisions and I think a lot of our administrators are already incorporating student voice. If I remember correctly, when Melinda came in and was reporting to us last fall about the mascot. 
she involved the students, there was a whole process that she went through, and it was sort of a way for the students to learn about influencing and, and, and making decisions that were going to impact them on something that was really significant for them. You know, what's our mascot going to be? And understanding the issue of why was that particular mascot why were we considering, is this an appropriate mascot? So again, I just, um, I, I do think a student could benefit from coming in, not, not having to report to us. I don't report to the board. I come in, I participate, I, you know, prepare for what we're going to be talking about. And you know, as when we talked to Bev Taft and, and uh, Tev Kalman at that meeting, you know, yeah, for some students that may, may not be that interesting, but another student may find it interesting to kind of have that bigger picture look right. at Just how does this So, but operate. that's not an ownership linkage. No, like that's no, an educational no, no. opportunity. That's, so I think yeah, again, I it's it sounds like we don't even know yet what our why is. We want this and for what? Because mm -hmm. um, there's two. There's an educational opportunity and there's a ownership linkage opportunity. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that for now because we're already way behind. Um, but I think this was really fruitful um, and, and productive, and I appreciate um, all of the discussion. Heather, you included. Thank you. And um, discussing ownership linkage plan, because it's a whole header, is going to be on the agenda um, regularly. So although this may be its own. Anyway, mm -hmm. here I go making us later. Thank you. Board process. Um, the annual agenda, approving the annual agenda is something we need to do annually. Um, for this one that was included in your packet, this is, was more of a formatting change. Um, the annual agenda did live in a, an Excel sheet and you had to scroll many miles in order to get to the April. Um, so, uh, on Anne's suggestion, I went ahead and reformatted so that the months actually go down the way and um, to, uh, categories are across the top. It's something we can have in our binders. I suggest you do that. Um, and, but other than that, I didn't make a lot of changes. I did, um, you know, update locations. I updated which schools were re reporting. That's such a Lucky word. We're visiting, um, depending on where our meeting was, just to try to make it as convenient or topic uh, appropriate. So it'd be lovely if we voted to either accept or not tonight, but before we do, um, is there a discussion to be had? It's very easy to follow the I was yeah. just getting used to the old style. <laughs> <laughs> you like the scrolling, do you? Oh, I need, oh. Headings are not on the last pages. I don't see the, the school. Where did you put the school? The schools are under the date. Oh, okay. On the left, yeah, on the left side. And then in ownership linkage is where you see RUHS attend and report, Braintree attend and report. Stuff like that. I also added um, for both September and October, this was a big change, sorry. Central office oh, admin attend and report. That might be Robin. Um, that might be Kayla. Um, Who's responsible for alerting them that they're welcome? Me. To oh, my, thank you. So, my, I'm going to be a stickler about this, sorry. Um, ownership linkage. That the having an administrator come in and, and report to us is not related to ownership linkage. That it are I thought we were bringing them in 
related to ends monitoring or ends related? How are we doing with our ends? So I would propose that we move, keep them there, but move it to ends because that's what we're having them come in to report about. That's right. How are we doing toward our ends? Could also just change the heading from ownership linkage to ownership slash stakeholder linkage. Yep. That's good. That's a good suggestion. But just, well, just do it whichever way is easiest. Yeah. Yeah. But it's related <coughs> to ends and achievement of the ends. I think sometimes we can't just all these things are all these things are intertwined. You, know, you are right and and so am I. Other thoughts? Um, are we comfortable? Should we take a vote? I think we can take a vote, including um, an edit of a of a copy and paste. Yep. So Heather, before you do that, when you look at the executive limitations monitoring, mm -hmm. and your your on your third superintendent, I think I figured out in pretty close to 30 years, right? You had some, mm -hmm. had this had this good rhythm going along, and you're at that spot where we're going to do the monitoring piece a little bit differently tonight than what you've typically done. And will this agenda be the agenda that you want to follow? Will this time frame that you've laid out? be what you're what you're looking to do. I'm happy to provide end reports, however oh, executive right, limitations how we you didn't want. change any of that. Right. Well I'd so this is what we the rhythm we'd like to be going for. Right. right. When we talk about like we did in the agenda meeting, kind of looking at it differently this year. Yep. Um, I think doesn't change the rhythm in which we aspire to work with him. Sure. So that we get through so many executive limitations. Although it will look different this year. So maybe that's a reason not to accept it. Right, because we have here. Let's call this a first read of the annual agenda. And I propose that I put it on uh, for next month to officially approve it, to vote to approve it, because once we get to the discussion we have about executive limitations, maybe that will help. I can say I don't think I clarity. understand what's happening here. You, you, yes, <laughs> you and I both. Although I should. <laughs> um, so, thank you for looking at it. There will be another one in the next packet. Oh, great. Welcome. Uh, nice. Visbit proxy votes. Michael, you want to talk about this one? You bet. Thank you. So each year, Visbit and VHI, and we only have the Visbit proxy votes at the moment, but I'll bet next month we will have VHI. Uh, Visbit is a pool, and so you have a vote about how your insurance company works. Visbit is your insurance company, works in a pool kind of format. As such, you have the ability to have representation at the annual meeting, which happens during the fall regular BSA, BSBA annual, annual meeting. You have two votes. Uh, one is because you participate in the multi-line program. Multi-line program is the liability, property, insurance, those kind of things. And you participate in the unemployment. That's your second that's your second vote. So you have the ability to either select someone from your board or someone else to go and in person vote on your behalf, or you have the ability to give your, to proxy your votes to the Visbit board. Uh, or you can choose not to participate. So those are sort of your three options and annually that uh, that's something that as a board you decide. So 
I've seen boards uh, have one of their members who's attending that particular uh, those workshops that that training participate. I've seen boards uh, boards have proxied that to me in the past uh, because they know I'm going to be there and then they know that I understand what they're looking for and I've seen boards proxy it to the uh, proxy it to uh, the actual Visbit board. Have so we ever participated in this before? Mm -hmm. I think we do this every year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And went last year. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had no idea. I mean, I was just like, okay, because again, the way we operate, we've got our executive limitations, we've got our business manager yep. that knows what's going on. For this year. And so it was, it was, I just sort of okay. took the lead of what the board, the Visbit board was recommending. So my, I mean, unless someone wants to go down and, I mean, if you're going to be an informed voter, as I was not, you would go down to, or I was informed in that I, I trusted that the board was going to support the best interests of our of school boards. But um, you, if you're going to do it, you've got to. I would recommend meeting with Robin and understanding because it's basically our insurer, and what you know if there are any concerns or you know whether or not. But I didn't feel like I had the information to really. That. Then I'd like to make a motion that we proxy to Michael for I'll this second. year. I will second. If Michael's willing. Absolutely. I can do it this year. Uh, I probably can't do it next year. I'll be on the ballot next year. I'm currently the chair of the Visbit board. So, okay. And I'm up again next year. Okay. So we can choose to give it to you or just give it to the board. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which next year. But we're giving it to the person who who's gonna who has, who our, has, best. has our best representing yes. us. Yes. All right. Yes. So all the uh, further discussion? All those in fa I made the motion you got that right. Yeah. All those in favor of uh, proxying to Michael. Aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Michael. We'll get that submitted. Appreciate that. Um, so board education, this is a rather large topic and I, oh, I'm tempted to, to table it, but we need to talk about overarching the year, what we want our board education to look like. We do have a budget line for it. Um, I'll say attending the VSBA conference um, was, was good. huge yeah. for me personally. Um, and you attended Sam um, and Heather, um, which was great also to experience it with you, Heather, and, and also with Lane at the time. Um, there is a requirement um, for me to do that with you guys, but I would do it anyway. No, it really was helpful, especially in the tricky budgeting season. I found that one um, to be especially helpful. So that's a huge one. It does cost money. I encourage everyone to go with that. Beyond that, um, we need to put together a plan to keep us smart. Well, I would like to encourage the board to look at that policy governance maintenance training program. I know um, I did it last spring and you know I've, I've been on the board for quite a while and I thought I understood <laughs> policy governance pretty well but you know it it is a governance structure that if you don't practice and you don't keep learning it, you're not gonna function very well so um, I, I would strongly recommend that we uh, jump in as a board and do it. It's not super expensive um, for the whole board to do it. It's very enlightening to be in communication with other school boards that are using policy governance because, you know, you 
you share, you know, what do you guys do with such and such or, you know, and I don't know. I, I found it super helpful and, um, and it also allows you to, like, be able to, you know, email Debbie or email Jeannie and say, hey, this has come up. What do you, what do you think about this? Um, Can we so look at the cost and vote on it next time? Do we know the cost? When is it? Uh, it is, it's for several months. You, you do it once a month. There's one in-person training in September. I didn't write down when that was exactly. It's either 350 a board member, if you're under five board members, and the, and the superintendent. They recommend that the superintendent do it as well, um, or 1,750 for the for the whole board, um, five members or more. Has registration come out for the annual conference? Yes. Just came out yesterday. I thought I saw it yesterday. Um, so I I'd like to get. An interest for that as well, um, and so you have that figure. I'd like that figure, and then for people to to look at the dates. Gosh, golly, shoot. Um, Wait. So just so I understand, the policy governance maintenance training is a multi-month training, or it's yeah, a yeah. So there's an in-person in September. I think it's September twentieth. And that's a full day event, or a that's a half a day. Three. Uh, Heather, do you remember? It was like three or four hours, right? When we did it last spring, last January or February. I thought and it then, was the full day. Wasn't it from eight to three? Was it eight to three? Oh, this new one might just be a half day. Okay. I, I don't right? don't quote me on that. Um, and the one we went to on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was eight to three. Yeah, so yeah. it may it may be a full day, one full day of training, and then and then the rest are uh, and they may increase the time, but they were online, so that's really easy to do the online ones because you don't have to be anywhere. You can just you know log in and and those are like an hour. Piece. Yeah, they were an hour. They might increase them to an yeah. hour and a half. But uh, just because we were always a little bit uh, stretched for time toward the end, but uh, again, just really, uh, I I found it very helpful to to hear from other board members and um, refresh on how to. I just want to look at our our budget line so that we're able to to vote because that would be paying for two trainings. I'm just looking, depending on how many people we have, um, it would be anywhere from 850 to 1450 for the Lake Maury conference, for the annual VSBA mm -hmm. conference. Um, and then this, it's I will tell you the time commitment does make me cringe a little bit um, on a very, on a personal level. That's tough for me. Can I ask a question about, so policy, so when I hear maintenance training, that to me indicates that someone might already have a skill set. So for people that are new to policy governance, is it beneficial? Um, I can answer that a little bit. So okay. as, I, as I'm coming on board into policy governance, not having really done policy governance before, I reached out to actually Jean Collins, and Jeannie suggested a couple things for me. One was the that exact training in September, and if I wanted to get a jump start on it, the, there is an individual uh, asynchronous training that is a policy governance and it's called policy governance accelerator that you could you could also do. She did suggest that there was a fair amount of overlap between the two, uh, but she. Didn't think that doing both was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So Sounds I like will be good. doing that policy governance training, the maintenance, mm -hmm. in September. Will the, the 
there be another spring offer? Uh, I don't know if they're going to do it in the spring again or not. Because okay. the conference is October 24 and yeah. 25. Yeah. Um, which just seem, you know, right. right on top of each other. It's not yeah. Obvious. Yeah. Well, in the conference, the first day, the 24th is just in the evening, right? And then the 25th was... They were or both is it, full days is last it year. Gonna, it's I not, know, they but I think they changed it. Oh, they did? It. Okay. Yeah. I think it's going to be just an evening thing on the first day and then a full day the second day. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But I don't know if they're changing the price, like if you only went to the second day. The, the, there are. Yeah. I've looked at the... I think you've got them up mm -hmm. to it. Speaking. Yeah. Um, this is a, a budgetary decision on top of a time commitment decision. Um, I think I think we should put a proposal together. I mean, if you want to propose that we use some of that budget line um, and and see how many people would be available, you know, what day it is for the in-person and then follow. And the same thing here. Um, and depending on how many people were going and when they were going, I need to read more carefully the details, um, decide how much, how much the annual conference would be. But it sounds like these are two biggies for, in terms of an education plan. There are also tons of webinars on the VSBA site right. Which that are really awesome. helpful. There's one called Policy Governance 101 mm -hmm. um, that are all free, yes. Uh, I'm going to move on for now, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. We are going to meet before that September date, so that's helpful. Um, okay, monitoring, hey, here we are. So instead of, there were actually, um, in terms of the annual agenda, going to be a few executive limitations. In our agenda meeting, um, Michael pointed out that not only is he new to the district, um, well, not only is he new to policy governance, but very new to the district. And executive limitation reports are from the past. He doesn't have the past to report on. Oh, come on. We, <laughs> I mean, if you want, so I looked at I looked at what Lane did, and Lane started off with a certification, and so I can certify that for the last forty five days, <laughs> everything that I have right here is true and accurate, and that I followed that. Right. I, I also heard at the first meeting that part of what's going on with this board, or maybe I interpreted from it, is that, sure, I can come up with an interpretation that's rational. In the end, and uh, like we said, I'm new to policy governance, so maybe after going to the training, I'll change my mind. But for me, I always view part of my role is that I work for the board, right? I'm here to help guide. I'm here when you set a direction. It's my thing to follow. I, and in the end, you're a lot of the you're a lot of the decision maker. And I know that within policy governance, I'm a lot of the decision maker. For me to make decisions that aren't moving in the direction that you would like to be moving in, seems like a waste of all of our time. And so, to me, when Anne, Hannah, and I were looking at this, uh, it made a little sense to kind of look at the interpretations at least the first time through, and say, hey let's talk about this. Is this interpretation where you are looking for it to be? And that might take a little longer than it has with somebody who's given you, I didn't go back and look at what the, how the interpretation changed over seven years or if it changed. And I certainly didn't go back and look at how the interpretation changed over the 20 years of the superintendent before, right? And how the ends changed and all of that. But I'm happy to do it however you however you as a board decide that you want to do it. To me, it seemed like an opportunity to be perhaps a little more interactive than right. what it sounded like it yeah. was. Which is why that annual agenda, in terms of approving it or not, 
the annual agenda said we're going to look at three executive limitations tonight. Um, we thought we'd just go down to one, that we could all look at it together. Because um, I think it's also a, a learning opportunity for us um, to really think about what we're looking for. You know, what, what our standard of rationality and reason is. Um, so I appreciate, Michael, you uh, proposing that we, that we slow down for a minute. Um, and Rachel, I heard you say the word collaboratively. That's, that's what we're going for. It may help you change what you're looking for, maybe your wording, maybe when you look at the interpretation or you think about the thinking that went behind the interpretation, uh, that you can do a little bit more. I mean, that, I think that there are, and sent along uh, two different interpretations of the global constraints one from Burlington, one from Winooski. The Winooski one, six, seven pages, I have it right here. I just didn't remember what the count was. Um, Lane, Lane's interpretation is a front to back, and Burlington's was like three pages. And so, you know, I did pull together a quick little, a quick little bit. To, how about I pass it so that you can see? Thank you. And do the homework assignment if you want the homework mm -hmm. assignment done that way. <laughs> right? Just to be clear, that was mm -hmm. my joke. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I don't. But what? Sam, I loved your joke. Come on. I loved your joke. I just didn't want. There's, there's a. Are these the same thing? Yes. yes. I sent half of them yes. each way okay. so they got All to right. you quicker. All right. All right. So, when I look at you, when I look at the statement, it's the superintendent shall not cause or allow any practice, activity, decision, organizational circumstance that is unlawful, unsafe, imprudent, or in violation of commonly accepted educational and professional ethics and practices. To me, that statement broke down into three parts. To other superintendents, I think they broke it down into like a dozen parts. But uh, so, shall not cause or allow. That means that the superintendent's responsible for ensuring that certain negative conditions do not occur. The way that we phrased it is in a negative way. They must take action to prevent these situations from happening. Okay? So, any practice, activity, decision, or organizational circumstance. This refers to all aspects of the superintendent's roles, including how they run the organization, the decision they make, and the activities they oversee. Probably as I'm sitting here thinking about it, probably also includes how I interact with people, which is what really drives me a little there. But the third, that is unlawful, unsafe, imprudent, or in violation of commonly accepted educational and professional ethics and practices. So the superintendent must avoid practices that break the law, pose risk to safety, whether physical or otherwise, that are imprudent, show poor, imprudent, show poor judgment or lack of foresight, or are a violation of ethics, disregard <coughs> widely accepted standards of professional behavior and educational practices. So that's how I interpreted where you were with your with your statement. And as I sit back, since part of this is a discussion, and I, part of it as a discussion lets me not write some things, it lets me say some things that I wouldn't necessarily put in writing. So the statement starts out in a way that tells me what not to do, as opposed to what should I do. And as an educator, one of the things that I learned a long time ago was that you're always better off telling kids what you'd like them to, to do and accomplish. Because for sure, if you tell them what not to do, you just gave them a whole lot of fun stuff that they're going to want to think about doing. And if you think about that, it's, just an, it's an interesting piece about how things, how things kind of go. 
I don't know. It seems like your, your statement's pretty common in policy governance. Uh, they're all and, negative. And it's because yeah. it's because they're limitations instead of aspirations. And so I'm going to learn more about that. But when I'm in a training about policy governance, that's the first thing I'm going to push on is that you're telling me what I'm limited to do. You're not telling me what I should aspire to accomplish. Right? And if that's where our relationship starts, that's an interesting thing. And someone who's really good at policy governance will push back on me on that, and it'll be a great conversation. I'm that student that kind of can be a pain in the rear end. So, uh, so the rationale here. Superintendent serves as a leader and role model for the organization. As such, their behavior sets a standard for others to follow. The global constraints establish the minimum acceptable standard for the superintendent's conduct. Failure to meet these standards can lead to a loss of trust and respect from the faculty, the staff, the board, and the community. This erosion of trust and support can undermine the effectiveness of the Orange Southwest School District, uh, negatively impacting its ability to provide quality education to students. Maintaining adherence to these standards is crucial for sustaining organizational integrity and operational success. The other thing that I also noticed as I was going through other people's, there, they, there was not as much student focus as what I tend to like to see. I think that putting students in the center of everything that we're doing is pretty, it's pretty critical. So excited to learn more about policy governance and how policy governance does that. So you can do that. That's yes. what's, that's what is, because as long as you're not doing these things, I know. you can do, you can, it, it relieves you of feeling like you have, you have to wait to be told what to do or that we will have to approve what you're deciding to do. It gives you that yes. freedom to, to make decisions and lead uh, as long as you stay, you don't break the law, do unethical things, make people unsafe. Right. Um, yeah. Would it, again, brand new, brand new to it is it's on an aspirational scale of one to ten it's fairly low on the aspirations right because it does it does set the bar off if, if all you expect if this is all that's expected and I know we've got a whole bunch more of these to do it doesn't the way that the way this reads to me is it could say Michael it's okay as long as you just do this we're happy with your we're ha what I heard the board saying at the last meeting one of the frustrations and nobody said it this directly uh, and sometimes I'm too blunt what I heard in the first meeting with you is that in some ways it's setting the bar so low that if I couldn't clear it, I shouldn't be a superintendent and we should have the board, the, the bar, several notches higher. So how do we set the limitations in a way that actually has your superintendent aiming for where you, where you actually want to be? I'm innately going to do that anyway. I've worked for boards that have a hard time articulating exactly what they wanted to do, and I try to intuit from what they talk about, how do I get to the level that they want to be? This is not the level that you want me to be. This is the level that you don't want me to cross. One point about this, because I'm also very new to policy yeah. governance, is the executive limitation the place to list aspirations? I mean, it strikes me that the ends are where we put aspirations. So maybe is this is is this really the utility of, of the executive limitations? It strikes me that they should be limitations, right? Like you're limited. You're limited. Don't don't do bad things. Um, but the ends are the aspirational piece. 
Yeah, I maybe. think so too. And I think there's there's actually a lot to this, right? Like this isn't an easy thing. I mean, it should be easy, right? But there's a lot to this, like mm -hmm. keeping everybody safe, like not allowing any any unsafe conditions. There's a lot of pieces to that. Yeah. In in you know five schools across the district and yes. all kinds of different people. There's there's this is not a small thing. Yes, and it was met last year, according to the report. I report compliance, and the report, the evidence for the report was uh, the 24 investigations of complaints that had happened. In the absence complaints of. Against What's that? Complaints against a variety of staff members, mm -hmm. faculty and staff, so that it was able to the way that it was reported last year, the fact that those complaints were investigated and followed through, um, was the evidence that this was this was achieved. Okay with it. I mean, I'm just saying that, no, I that feel that's the that's the piece of the conversation that I'm. I think that you're at a spot where we can have that conversation, and as we go through, there's two ways for me to approach it, right? One way for me to approach this is to pull together. Here's what here's what you've done in the past. You've been happy with it in the past, or you've accepted it in the past. It didn't sound like you were necessarily always happy with it. And, or, we can sit here and we can have a conversation as we work our way through to make sure that, in fact, you've got the limitation worded the way that you want the limitation, the ends the way that you want the ends to be, and, you know, where do, where do, where do we want? So it can be a transactional or it can be a transformative kind of uh, situation, I think. It's probably some combination of both because you probably don't want to be here until midnight tonight and every night that we get together and look at these. So if we look just at global constraint, if we look just at this policy, yeah. just regarding last year's interpretation and yeah. evidence, what what evidence would help us understand would help us know that this is this is being met, that, the, that this isn't being violated. This this guardrail is not being battered or crossed. Yeah, so in my 45 days, what I provide you is that as we started working with uh, this year in the last 45 days, we have, sorry, I knew I wouldn't necessarily remember when I got there. Uh, we've been proactively addressing climate by, by implementing and restarting our positive behavior uh, investments in support, interest in support. Uh, we're addressing the physical safety within in-service. These are two things that are happening within in-service. And I've, in 45 days, done some coordinating with the police department on an issue that occurred. Right, so for 45 days, those are, the, those are the kinds of things that I could sign and attest that say, hey, here's the direction that we're headed, uh, a way we're going, if I were following if I were following the format of last year, I would say so far I've had zero, uh, sorry, I've had one, one sort of formal complaint that was resolved proactively at the first level that didn't require a superintendent to be involved. I think it's important, first of all, I, I do want to say that I feel respectfully and appropriately challenged right now like really kind of neatly challenged and I and I appreciate that. I do like that. <laughs> um, but I also think it's important to remember that the executive limitations is not if it's in compliance right now and then something comes up and I say mm, I think you might be out of compliance I want you to to do this rather than what the annual agenda says because we're not always going to keep to it. Yep. I want you to look at the global constraints again. I, I think the executive limitations and whether the superintendent is in compliance is almost like a living document. Because you might slide out of compliance and then we need to say, okay, how are you gonna get back in? It's not a, a final answer as that game show goes. Um, 
or a, a final grade. Um, so that evidence that you just suggested might be in a report, yes, that, that sounds like you're in compliance. I may have questions about a part that might be out of compliance, so I would say I'm not ready to accept this report because I want you to look more closely into So when I said I felt appropriately challenged, I think that it's transactional in that whether or not we should have accepted, should have, we, we were right in that moment to accept the, the executive limitations um, from last time. I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of pushing back, um, which is exciting to me. That's, yeah. that's. I've got nothing to say that you should or should not have accepted. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, from, yeah. You know, that in fact, that, that, that was, that was the relationship that you had, and that made sense, and if that's what made the board happy at that point, and if the board is happy moving forward with that, then that's, that's great. You can do that. It's an opportunity. I think the opportunity that you, you, every time you change leadership, you have challenges and opportunities. Right? The opportunity that you have is that I don't have a preconceived notion of how things are supposed to work or how they have worked or what the history was or, or whatnot. And the challenge is, I don't have a preconceived notion of how things are supposed to, right? So I'll slow you down in, in different ways or be incomplete. You, so you choose as a board what parts of that you want to build on as a, as a strength and which parts, you know, are, are going to be are going to be the challenge. So I'd like to make a proposal that um, f for the time being, and again, this affects our annual agenda, that we plan to do one per meeting, mm -hmm. and it be in this format, in that you bring us something, and with evidence, yep. um, and we respond to it, because it's it's not just a learning like I just said it's also a learning experience for us every time no matter how much training you have um, so instead of we will we won't get through them all that's my point this year we're not going to get through them all if we do it how I'm proposing we do it but I think we should do one per meeting and it gives us an I think that gives us an opportunity to go deep like if you look at this and think mm, Michael, you mailed it in. You only gave me three. Mm. Wilmer over here gave 12. <laughs> right? Well, re and remember that you're going to get sort of more versed in, oh, I could be including this mm -hmm. in, that, in that global constraint. Um, again, back to that <laughs> policy governance. Uh, training, it was interesting to hear different superintendents go, you know, the first year, because I was learning, I, I, you know, I kind of did this, this, and this, and boards, I mean, even as a board, we've sort of struggled a little bit with, okay, we get this monitoring report, is this reasonable? Are, you know, how are we monitoring? Do we really understand what we're doing? And, and I've heard you know, even for myself sometimes, I'm like, uh, should I be at, you know, is this, is this interpretation sufficient and reasonable, you know, is the evidence, you know, does it back up the inter interpretation? Because I'm noticing here, um, interpretation should also have kind of a, an operational or a, a, it can be a listing of things that are in place um, that, so I interpret, because you haven't told us what you're interpreting compliance to be. Mm -hmm. So you interpret, you say, I will, uh, you know, to be in compliance, you know, these things will all be in place in the district. And that and would be the evidence, though, wouldn't it? Uh, well, it's a compliance measure. So you, you, the, the interpretation also needs to be operationalized. So 
And that for the longest time stumped me. But then in this further training, operationalized can also mean that it can be a list of things that are in in place. So um, I, I see that in 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 what you what Lane did last year, his last sentence Towards this end, the superintendent must work to ensure proper behavior on behalf of the organization and its constituents and must address behaviors that fall short of these standards in a fair, just, and transparent manner. And that's hence why it's the 24 investigations. And that they were handled Fairly, properly. transparently. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and it, I mean it, and it is kind of a it's a it's a learning process, and they're going to change slightly. Um, even Jeannie was saying that she did one, and then the next year she realized, oh, I'm actually out of compliance. So she had to say to the board, you know, I was out of compliance. Then I did this, and I got myself in compliance. But it was because the limitation made her look at what was going on in the district and then she was like, ooh, I don't have something there and so then she, she put it in. The other thing that I, I would be curious to see what other districts do because a lot of times they're sort of the global statement but all of the other executive uh, limitations like 2.1, all of the rest of them, I wonder if in the way that we are monitoring that we monitor this one last because mm -hmm. I think I've read in some other ones from other districts that this one comes in last because then one of your evidences is I do I'm doing all of these other things and these other things oftentimes give you more specifics about what needs to be in place to be in compliance. Yep. Especially with these executive limitations because they're very detailed. As you'll notice after this one big global one, yep. it gets pretty specific about what has to be in place. So, so Anne, yeah. what if um, you and I, um, because we're the agenda builders, but anyone else who can look through the executive limitations and suggest or propose which one might work best for 45 plus 30, so 75 days in um, at our next meeting. And really kind of throw that section of the annual agenda out the window and be more thoughtful and um, uh, mm -hmm. what, we, what makes sense to interpret next month. Let's not go numerically. Well, actually, when I'm looking at this next one, treatment of students, parents, and guardians, if I remember correctly, when I have children in the district, this is the time when you're getting all those handbooks, you're getting all that paperwork that you got to fill out. So this might be actually a good, good one to look at because if one, you probably, you may not be familiar yet with all of the stuff that goes out as the school year begins that alerts parents to services that can be provided, um, that's eliciting information from parents regarding their kids. Um, so that one might actually be okay for the next one. Let's give it a go. I want to say it bothers me to not get through them all. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish there was a way that we could get through them all. Mm -hmm. Let's do two meetings a month. What? Two meetings a month? Yeah. <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> we could um, consider, I'll just. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go, ahead. Go ahead. We could consider going through more in our July meetings. It's part of board work. The retreat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe the one per month won't last past um, October. You know, there are some that are small. That's true. Yeah, we might not, Rachel, and I need you to work to accept that. <laughs> 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 
I, I have my own OCD it's so stuff imperfect. Too. It's so imperfect. I know. <laughs> I, uh, if I had to give you an opinion on the two uh, s sample uh, reporting um, evidences that you gave us there, yeah. I liked the former rather than the latter, with, where you gave us the handful of things that you were actively doing. Uh -huh. right? You know, like that, I don't necessarily think that we need to state that in the executive limitations, but just from a feedback standpoint, I appreciate the, the more candid, this is what we're doing, rather than we didn't have any of these situations, so I report compliance. Um, so. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Also yeah. Well said, Sam. Sam, do you think that's because those are proactive? The things that I put in there are proactive versus the... Retrospective. The flip are yeah. reactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where I think we're, so part of where I think we need to head as an organization is how are we explicitly proactively addressing really mission climate communication this year. But that's sort of where I'm at. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, so we're not, because it's, I mean, you, you, verbal evidence to us, but it, it's not here. So I'm not going to um, ask for a, a vote on on accepting or not. Um, well, this would be the first review anyway. Right. So. Um, so I can add it to the next time if you want and say, hey, we did, we, we've got a draft of one that either take it or you don't. Right. We can, we can tweak it. We can List keep going. that evidence that you had. It'll be a second read and we yeah. We'll have a vote, and then also a first read of the next one. Yeah. And we'll just keep working it out. Cool. Um, okay. Thank you, Michael, yeah. for your work so on that. So I, I wanted to just, the other thing that you can do with these is you can, you can state, I, I, um, you know, like if you wanted to use, I, I will be in compliance with all of the other EL reports, mm -hmm. you can say, by the time I finish all of the other EL reports, I'm going to be in compliance with all of those, and that's some of my evidence that I am overall um, in compliance with the global constraints. I love what you're realizing there, and is that the order that they're in in the annual may or may not make. May or not make may or may not make sense because I think the other thing that's happening with this is this is once you've got a superintendent who's been there for a while mm -hmm. the the global constraint does encompass a whole year so that's, that's just one of the examples of it may not have made sense for the that to be the first one when you're transitioning a new superintendent in but it makes perfect sense for this time of the year to be that one when you've completed a year. Mm -hmm. And that may be the only one that sits there and says, hey, this doesn't make sense. I don't know. I'm kind of excited to do it. See how it goes. Excellent. Um, OK, moving on, uh, policy decisions. Uh, first read of the revised ENDS policy. Um, that was from that our last meeting and the the um, poster that we made, the one, I still have it. Nice. Um, and uh, Emil was our kind of Ghost clerk writer. for that part, yeah. so <laughs> thank you. She sent me that and we put it into a document. What um, do people want to say about it? You did such a good job on this. It's a little wordy for me, but it doesn't mean I don't like it. Well, it's a little run on. I, I'm sorry, but I, <laughs> I'm, I. It's not an ends policy. It's a mission statement, but it's not an ends policy. We said the opposite at our last meeting. We did. I, the exact opposite. I we know. We were calling it a mission at, statement. If you look at what an end statement is, this is not an end statement. So. But again, that's 
um, you know, if you, it, you start with that one or two sentence, that kind of like the global constraint where it's like one big sentence um, or, you know, one sentence, but, and it's, you know, who are the beneficiaries, um, what are they going to get, and at what cost, or, uh, that's not exactly the right thing. Heather? I agree with Ann. I'm surprised uh, to see what's in the board packet. I thought we were going to have this as the the like beginning, and then after that, the the benchmarks like we previously had, uh, we like out, like outlining the you know the ELA and the mathematics and the science and the life skills, and what I'm seeing in the board packet is that's missing. So is this proposal just an addendum to the existing ends? Or is the, so thank you for any clarification. Yes, and I think there is a whole lot of confusion at this table because when we last meeting, the ENDS subcommittee brought something called a mission statement, a revised one for people to think about and it looked kind of like this it's one. In, thank you. But in that meeting, it was stated that it was an ENDS policy, not a mission statement. So, and this, and, and the reason it was a mission statement is because how the ENDS policy reads right now is it starts with a mission statement. I, I, is it in here? I'm not, it's not in front of me. Yeah. And then is broken down. Which still, it, thank you. Oh, so I didn't send the whole thing. Oh, this is my mistake. So we just need, we need. This the is whole, totally my mistake. We just need the second half of that. Yeah. Drop in there. But you put it in the added stuff. You're better than I am. So yes, Heather, <laughs> half of it, good two thirds of it was missing. But we didn't just, did we actually end up, we just did, we just wordsmithed the first piece. We just didn't, the mission act, we didn't actually go through the rest mm -hmm. of it. We have not looked at that yet. No. This so, was what we were looking to approve <clears throat> yet. Yeah, I, I feel like we haven't discussed or like hashed out the rest what, of it. The, like we're not, we're not ready to sort of adopt the whole thing. Or no, like, or even have a first reading of the whole thing. No, but I. But we did talk about using this, mm -hmm. taking the thing we wordsmithed in July and making this a first and reading of that, that piece. making that global statement of the mm -hmm. ends policy. But not the entire ends policy. Right. right. So. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why don't we just yes. discuss the wordsmith part here and then take it at next meeting? The whole thing. So it, it seems like we should adopt the entire thing all at once. So we still need to have a first, even if, even though we have this now, we still need to have a first reading of the whole thing. Yeah. And then a second reading of the whole thing. Yeah, and then about that's really right. So. So this is a review of a piece. Correct. Yes. Perfect. But it is not as listed on the gen the agenda, the, the first read end. of the revised end policy. Correct. Yeah. It's just what we wordsmithed. So it is the mission statement portion of the ends policy. And I apologize. The beginning of the ends. <gasps> the beginning. It's the beginning of the ends. It is. God, you're <laughs> so on it. Um, so then, the, so, so I think does anyone have any comments on just this piece? This is not a first read. The first read needs to <clears throat> uh, include everything else. This is not a first read of the policy. You said it was too wordy. Is there anything you want to take out? Yeah. 
I couldn't decide on something to take out, no. Um, I think it's We're not going to call it that, though. I think it's a fine mission statement. I don't think it's an end policy. No. That's, that's my... It's we, not, no, exactly. We, we, it's incomplete. We talked about that. <clears throat> no, but even the global statement, this first statement is not how an ends policy starts. You start Could it be how policy. our ends policy starts? Uh, yes. I guess. I mean... I mean, there is... A, I realize there are... This is where I get neatly with policy governance, because I realize there are boundaries and restrictions and limitations and, and right things and wrong things. But I think at a certain point, we have to take ownership. If this is what we want our mission to be, then it gets to be the mission statement. Call it whatever you want. Yep. Yeah. This is the mission statement. That's good. And we all don't have to agree. Absolutely. <laughs> but it's not whether it's right or wrong as a mission statement. If you don't agree that this is our mission or you want to change it, I can totally get on board with that. But it's not an incorrect. It's, it doesn't not reach a standard of we're not in, in following the rules of policy governance. <clears throat> Let's move on. Yeah. We're not I, going to I, anything I, here. Let's I, go to I, I will not. I mean, it's fine. It, I'm, I, it's, Mike will have to uh, operationalize it. We'll see what comes of it. It, I mean, I, I may not vote for it, but that's, you know, that's my prerogative. Absolutely. So. As a statement, Ann, what's your concern about it? Well, I, I think it's, I think it's way too detailed and too specific. I think we need a more general, like why do we want lifelong learners? So what is our ultimate, because part of what, we want it to be feasible also. Um, and I just, uh, I think we got caught up in, in uh, trying to put all of those specific things from the portrait of a graduate into the, into the global statement in terms of what we want to accomplish. You can put the other things in, but those are going to come in down below. I, I don't know. And I don't... I. I am not an expert at policy governance. I'm not an expert at ends, writing end statements, but when I read through what end statements look like and, and you know, how they would have you construct them, this seems that it's not, it's not really following the format. Maybe we don't follow the format. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I don't know the answer, and I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not. What I'd really like to see is what, how he's going to interpret it, because that's more going to going to give me a little bit more information about whether or not our ends policy is going in the right direction. Do you have um, ideas of how to interpret this, Michael? I is do. This, is this problematic for? Is this a problematic statement? Is, is you try to operationalize it or imagine operationalizing it? Well, I know that right off the top that this is linked into our portraits of graduate work, and so there should be natural connections that happen with the portrait of graduate. We should all be moving towards what the portrait of a graduate talks about and moving to. So from my standpoint that makes that makes sense and so as I looked at this and tried to interpret it it's certainly a longer interpretation right I have to tell you what do I think uh, a lifelong learner is what is creative what's a problem solver 
I have to work through all of these pieces and that gives us the opportunity to agree on that those things do mean do mean that mm -hmm. and so that's that's the piece so there's a lot there's a lot here to figure out and it's the work that it's the work that I think everybody in this organization wants to be doing right the piece about it is is it, it, it it's aspirational so do I think that today all of those things are happening for every kid exactly the way that we want to know and might they never yep they might never and are we working towards that then yes and so probably what I would end up reporting in this ends is that we're not accomplishing this end yet and we continue to work on it here are the kinds of things that we've done and in my head I'm picturing here are the kinds of things that we're going to do moving forward and how that fits into a policy governance board I don't really understand completely completely yet I intuitively feel like that's something that's important so that you as a board know where we've been and where we're going from the point of view of the superintendent so I don't know this is this is the work that in every organization I've been a part of this is what drives me you give me you give me the mission the ends the whatever and I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into it and I'm gonna have everybody who works for the organization understanding that at OSSD we develop lifelong learners who are created it's gonna take me a little while but <laughs> <laughs> but you're gonna hear it so that's the other thing that's important is you got to know that if this is what you believe and this is what you're looking for then I'm gonna keep bringing that back to you that's that's it this isn't this isn't my Clark School District it's the Orange Southwest School District so how that looks and what we move with it becomes important and I know to me it's not exactly a mission statement because it is a little too long and it needs to become more I get a picture if I if I tell you uh, we make dreams come true you guys know whose mission that is right we make dreams come true at South School Disney Disney right uh, or all the world's all the world's information at your fingertips. Google. You got it. Right? So your mission, when we're ultimately there, we're going to say it, and somebody's going to say, that's the Orange Southwest School District. Right? Well, ends committee. Sounds like we have some more. We have some more. And it's I go to Disney. Yeah. <laughs> so... You're also working on a mission statement <clears throat> with your cabinet. I am, and that's why I didn't want this, and so I'm glad that this still hasn't evolved as a mission statement, because as soon as you identify as a board that you've developed a mission statement, I'm going to say, well, why am I developing a mission statement? You've already determined what the mission is. We're not doing is. a mission statement. We talked yes, about this I in think, July. We're yeah, not doing we a mission statement. We're doing schools. an ends policy. Yeah. You're doing a mission statement. Yeah. yeah. So to me, what's going to happen is the mission has to incorporate the ends and the end statement. They're going to be, they're going to be overlapping. It's not going to, I mean, imagine if, imagine if uh, Disney was through the use of theme parks <laughs> oh, <right>. and <laughs> movies and we make dreams come true, right? <laughs> now they have all of that somewhere. They, it's down, it's down a couple layers. And how it fits together, I think, becomes the important piece. And I'm also going to work hard at not getting hung up on, you're calling it this, I'm calling it that. It's great. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move along until somebody says, hey, I'm not happy with the way that's going. Can you, can you adopt the terminology more along, more along the way? So, right? And I'm going to learn. And I think we're all going to learn along along the way. I've heard lots of people at this table say, I'm no expert on policy governance. Great. So we're all learning together, and that's kind of cool, because we're a learning organization. 
So the ends committee, let's meet and right the four of us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, do some more work. And the rest of the board expect uh, a first read of a policy next time. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Oh boy, we're way behind. Um, Want to go fast on this one? Video surveillance policy. Go. It's here. This is not a required policy in the state of Vermont. However, it is a recommended policy in the state of Vermont. Um, and I still am in the process of doing a little bit of homework around this. You don't currently have this as one of your policies. Uh, and Anne asked me to look at and talk with some people around, could I just as easily call this a procedure and have it in the procedures as opposed to the policy, uh, in the policy area. And so I can, there's no question that, about that. In fact, uh, when I had boards that said, I don't want to adopt that policy, I said, okay, great, I'll just adopt it as a procedure and that'll be great. So whether you adopted it or didn't adopt it, it doesn't matter, this can be the, the procedure that happens at the Orange Southwest as long as it doesn't go against one of your other policies. What that doesn't necessarily do, so the difference between a policy and a procedure, is the policy has the weight of the board behind it. It does say that that is, you following this, is an expectation of the board. Because without this, I could have a video surveillance policy that says I'm going to post everything on YouTube at the end of the day. I'll open all the camera feeds up, unless there's another policy that you have that says that I can't. Which we might. Multiple you know? <laughs> executive limitations. I think treatment of staff. I don't think. Okay, let's, let's, let's not, uh, he wasn't actually proposing that, and we yeah. do not have to. I, that I know, directly. but so, I mean, well, I'm just reminding him that he does have. There are limitations. I know limitations that. to what he can do, so he may. Right. Not have that policy in place, but you can't. You can't just go do whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could go with a more. I could go with a more succinct uh, piece of this. It's how I interact with different agencies and whatnot, because I can tell you that I could go either direction there, right? And without guidance from the board as to what direction you'd like me to go, I could very easily go the wrong way, a way that you don't want, and I could make a rational interpretation that made sense as to why I would do that. Mm -hmm. It's so not as crazy not, as the posting. I went with a crazy one as right, whatever. On but So I, I don't know that this is a first read because I think what we talked about and I didn't put in, I didn't change any of the language from it. We just took it directly from the website so it wouldn't be a uh, true first read. That it would be more of a, I think what we talked about in our planning meeting was is this a place where we want to get more specific and prescriptive or do we want to stay with just the required? And that's kind of that's kind of a board that's a board flavor to me as to what you all want to do as a board. And we didn't feel like it made sense for just the three of us to make that decision mm -hmm. without the board. So we have video cameras in you place do? already. Yes. And it is a recommendation that it's a policy and not a procedure. True. I I think that it is would be wonderful to have this policy. I don't know necessarily. I mean, I read this policy. I haven't read it in comparison with other policies, but um, you know the things about it being in public areas where there's not a perceived um, there's not perceived privacy. There were some things in there that really spoke to me, and I think that it also is a way for people who are maybe not aware that, that things are being recorded to notify people that things are being recorded. I think, you know, policy sets the rules, but it also provides information to things that, about things that are happening. Others, should we put this in for a first read? Yes. As a policy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had one uh, just personal 
learning question. What's uh, somewhere in here? It says no sound is recorded, and is that a is that a state guideline for that reason or? It's number four. Number four. Thank you. So. Security cameras shall not make audio recordings without prior approval from the superintendent. Is that what you mean, Sam? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, may I, may I speak to that? Certainly, please, please, Heather. I think it's very important that we amend. Uh, this is a recommended policy, so we have license to amend. Our buses record audio because the driver cannot supervise and that audio is critical none of our other cameras record audio but on the buses they do and without it we would not be able to keep peace on the buses so just wanted to add that in case we're moving this on to a recommended policy for first read if we could draft some language about on the buses and I love the language that currently exists in it without authorization from the superintendent. Yep. Right? Because it still gives that flexibility that policy governance allows for while setting some guide yep. guidelines and doesn't require the board to be at that micromanagement level of this. So you will allow, you will authorize the use of audio recording on the buses? I would imagine that I would allow the authorization of video recording on the bus. And audio. Audio. And audio. Video yes. with, with audio. Yes. Okay. So um, if I could ask Michael and or Heather um, to update this with obviously putting the name of our school in there. Um, uh, we'll do a real first read. Real, and we'll yeah. do a real first read. Yep. Cool. Yep. I have a question. Is there uh -huh. a way to turn the audio on the app? There's definitely over on the screen there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, here. But every time Heather speaks, I jump on this. Heather, can you say something? Is sorry, this better? Way better. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> sorry, Emil. I do have a teacher voice, but I was I wasn't using it. I, I think it's the owl. Yeah, yeah. It it's definitely it's definitely technology. Um, okay, great. So that'll come back for a first read as well. Okay, sorry. Um, monitoring the board board self evaluation. Um, it is it is eight oh four. May I propose that we move this self evaluation to next week? Yes. Next month. Yes. Yeah. I'll second. Do we need to? Do oh, a I move. Yes. I'll that. second. And you're seconding. Uh, further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Great, motion passes, thank you very much. All right, consent agenda. We have three items. I'd like to look at the first two um, together for a vote and then the third because that is something that we um, got tonight. And, uh, and since we, for uh, members may or may not have been able to do a quick scan, um, uh, let's deal with the first two items and then maybe Michael or Heather and or Heather um, can give us a the gist of it. So first, updated signers and minutes. Thank you. So the signers are just changing who can Right, from Jason to Lisa. We'll need to adjust signers on the following accounts. So this this second column is signers that need that are. Hmm. Yep. So what's going on here is. Uh, 
we have the person who used to be able to sign was Jason Finley, and now instead of Jason Finley, we're having uh, we're having Lisa Floyd, Lisa. Herb Perez, Linda Lebold, and Kelly Tucker. And that's because Jason's moving on. And that's because yeah. Jason's okay. moving on, and so that's that's what it is. And then on the that's the that's the Bar Harbor accounts, which look like they are student activity accounts. And then the other one is, again, Jason moved on. And so same, removing him and adding the same people as new signers. And it just needs, it needs a motion mm -hmm. and board approval. Great. And the minutes from both June and July, does anyone have any edits? Uh, I attended oh. June. Uh, and I'm not listed as and it doesn't say. Yeah. Okay. And my name is spelled incorrectly, and one of them said something in minutes. Oh, in June. Look at you guys stepping right into Katja's role. <laughs> yeah, she was the only one who would do the minutes thing. So, um, Kyle, if you could, for the June 19th meeting, just include um, Ryan in attendance and then Emil has an I between the A and the M, yeah. right? Sure you were on the I took the minutes and I didn't list myself. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, number f on, on August 1st, August 1st, August 1st, on number 5, yeah. 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 Um, it's, uh, and it's updates to the OSWD board. It's Take oh, it should be an S. O S S D. <laughs> oh, mine says O S S D. Well, mine says O S W D. Number five. It's the V. Isn't that the same set of minutes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. In June. There, yeah, there it is. Um. Cool. Anyone else? All right. Uh, I'd like to move uh, to approve two items from the consent agenda. Uh, the signers and the minutes with edits of attendance and a W to an S. Second. Thank you, Sam. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion passes. All right. Nika's request. So you have in the supplemental board packet tonight uh, a request from Nika. And what Nick is asking to do is to be able to access reserve funds from RTCC to hire the instructor for the health careers program. Uh, what happened, my understanding of what happened with this is initially the plan had been to stop offering dental. Mm -hmm. However, prior to me getting here, there was funding provided by the state to provide a dental program. And what they learned was uh, if they didn't keep going with the dental program, there's like 130 something thousand dollars that they've got to pay back. And there's a number of kids that are in dental that wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't get dental. Um, so uh, we had not been able to find a health uh, careers teacher and we were looking at saying hey how do we how do we manage to offer the kids that are in the health careers H essentially long story short how do we combine the two programs um, our numbers have come up and they just got the opportunity to hire the health careers teacher so what this means is using funds from the RTCC reserve I talked with Rob and there's seven hundred plus thousand dollars in that account. So there's funding in this to be able to fund the salary and benefits for the person for one year. Um, and uh, I think that we're in the spot with the technical center where we had a we had a it's a transition year last year. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff was going on over there. Uh, enrollment this morning is at 123 kids, which incidentally, the way that uh, funding or student counts work in the technical centers for billing is you take a six semester rolling average of students, the 123, 
is precisely the number of students that was six semesters ago. So if we stay there, we are we're tracking in a tracking in an equivalent place to where we were where we were six years ago. Uh, you know, Nika and Clayton have been doing some good work to get us up and ready for the year. Tech Center's gonna uh, be it's got a lot of turnover, so there's not a lot of institutional knowledge uh, with the tech center. So uh, I think this is something that we can do to make sure that we're not creating another hard transition for kids. Uh, but our dental program will be a small class, and the health is not going to be a huge. Like, they're both to, to cut combined. They might be 10 kids in the, in the two programs. So. Um, up to you all whether like, in order to be able to access reserve funds uh, we need your we need your approval Heather something to do yeah. something to add yes I would love it Michael that's a beautiful job and I'd like to add the woman that we would like to hire for the un we, we had basically you may remember we agreed to cut the dental position um, and combine it with health careers because it's so hard to hire. We never anticipated we would get an, a qualified dentist, which we hired. And now we have a qualified RN who wants the job. Yeah. That it, it's so hard to hire. I just want to let you know, these two candidates um, are highly qualified and they want the job and we could do so much good work with these people so i want you to let, to let you know we're not like these are not creative fits these are extremely highly qualified so we've got a dentist and like i don't know if it's what it's not an md but what's the the qualification to be a medical dentist right yes yes, yes. and then for health careers not just someone with like you know maybe a certification but she's an rn and it, that's something we've been looking for for years so that's my extra little piece i have Thank a question you. Um, for these new hires with their certifications is it possible for them to um I guess, is it possible for the students in these programs to come out with a certification? So it is graduating? certainly possible for them to come out with certifications in the health. Those, those were built in mm -hmm. and, and ready to go. And we're figuring out how do we do that for dental. Okay. So dental's not in place today, mm -hmm. but I think dental will be in place soonish. Okay. I think it would just uh, be very appealing for um, numbers to go up um, yeah. for students if they knew I can graduate with the certification, so, with the, the dental and or health. Yeah. So the technical center is the other area that I don't have experience with. Right. Right. And so one of the things that I did uh, in the first month that I was here was I reached out to the the person at the state who runs the technical programs for the state and had a long conversation and I've had multiple conversations with Nika who was already talking certifications and ensuring that there were two certifications or college credit that every student who participates in the technical center comes out with. That's I think great. that one of the things that's going to be important for Nika and Clayton, part of what we've talked about is they're really they're running a technical center and they're running a training school for technical center teachers and so helping those teachers be able to know how do we get certifications is important so they've gone through and they've mapped what certifications they're expecting oh. people to get i think that's a pretty fair way of saying it heather what do you think oh absolutely um i want to confirm that health careers will be offering both now if we have an rn we can offer again the lna which we have not offered for the past two years because we didn't have someone qualified to administer it so the lna and uh we'll continue with the uh, uh the medical assistant and the proposal is it's going to take some time 
uh, with someone who's qualified and invested to earn the dental tech. That's gonna take probably a year to two years. And so the proposal is to do a synergy between these two programs and let the med uh, dental students also earn the medical assistant um, because that's really based in anatomy and physi physiology like assessments. And so they could simultaneously earn that as they work toward their dental tech. So the answer to your question, Sarah, is yes. We want them to have graduate with the, IR they call them IRCs, industry recognized credentials. And that's really important to us. And um, so that was a really great question. And thank you for that question. Rachel, you had another question? Good. No, it wasn't a question, it was a comment. No, oh, good. We're good. We're good. Yep. Okay. Other questions in order to approve or not? Can we take a vote? Mullet? I move to vote. To approve. To, 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 to approve the request. Yes. I'll second. From Nika. Seconded by Sarah. Thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank Mika for her work, please. Uh, superintendent's report. So we have the financial report that was also in the um, uh, 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 added materials. Sure. Sorry? Last page. Last page. Yeah, last couple pages. Are so there you want the really quick, yeah. quick, quick, and, sure. quick and dirty here? Yes. <laughs> you've got uh, you've got a pretty extensive written report from me. Most of uh, those items we're going to cover a little bit later in the packet or in the in the agenda. I'd be happy to talk more specifically about what's going on uh, in the report. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those. Specifically, I would call out the uh, happens to be great that Corey's sitting right out here because. Uh, you ran this really fantastic summer program this year, and Corey was one of the people who coordinated it. Uh, really amazing, all of the faculty and staff, I made it over at least four times, and all the faculty and staff kids just absolutely raved about it. The, I didn't get to talk to a lot of parents, but the ones that I did were also really excited. So My little girl enjoyed it. There you go. Oh, great deal. Another so thing. Thank you for good, that. Good, okay. I, I hope you got to engage with Ellie a bit. I didn't get to preschool very much, okay. but, um, but I had a great time and we took some wonderful field trips and I had nothing but positive comments from staff and, and kids and parents. So, yeah. So lots of great work. Had a great retreat with the with the cabinet. Uh, you know, it's been a it's been an awesome welcome. I really I really appreciate it. Again, happy to answer specific questions. Uh, I do want to point some towards the direction of the financial report. Uh, Robin has had the, uh, may or may not know, we were down uh, a person in the business office. Yes. We are sent back up to where we need to, where we need to be. Oh, great. And that has, uh, but it, it's made it so Robin has got to spend some extra time, like I mentioned earlier, she was here later than, later than me, uh, at least one night this week, so. Um, she and I connected today. Uh, the highlights from the financials are the OSSD end of year. Uh, looks like it generated a $2.3 million surplus. I'm going to temper that just a little bit though because you did run an $82,000 deficit in the food service program. So some of that, some of that 2.3 will need to offset the, the food service deficit. Uh, the, the surplus was generated in three major areas. 800,000 of it was in special education costs. So uh, special education did not end up costing or we weren't able to staff what, uh, what we had hoped or wanted to. Is that the bulk of it was 800,000 vacancy? No, but I mean vacant staff positions. Uh, it, the way that Robin spelled it out for me was uh, it was in staff, primarily in staffing, and out of district placements were oh. down. And whether those were down because uh, they could be down or down because we weren't able to access it. Out of district placements have become really hard to get into. And so creative solutions that meet the requirements of the law but maybe don't, they're not quite what they're not quite what we had planned 
I suspect it's, and I suspect it's a combination of both. Uh, we spent less in the HRA, so the health reimbursement accounts, than what we had allocated and budgeted for, and salaries overall were lower than what we had what we had budgeted. Uh, likely that is uh, we hired in many cases last year people who were lower on the salary grid than people that they replaced. So that was the that was where the primary drivers of that surplus. Again, the eighty-two thousand dollar deficit in food service. There's a little. There's some question marks about that. So there, that number might change. But for right now, that's that's where it is. Uh, I got the sense from Robin that that might reduce as they look at a couple a couple pieces that they're trying to finalize as they get ready for closing the FY twenty four books. And you also oversee the technical center, and the technical center generated in twenty four a. Uh, a five hundred thousand dollar surplus. Uh, in addition to that carry forward of seven hundred thousand, uh, but in this case, some of that five hundred thousand will be returned to the tuitioning towns. Uh, so that number, I don't believe, will end up at five hundred thousand, according to state statute. Those were the highlights from the from the financial. Uh, I have one mild, minor question. It can be very quick on one of the items that we signed. I saw a $42,000 line item to something called the Dead River Company. Do we know what that was? I just Dead, that's oil. Oil. Oh, is that oil? Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't, I didn't recognize the name. Thank you. Thank I'm you so glad. I'm thank so you for glad checking you. carefully on mm -hmm. things you're signing. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, right. the, the, Thing Ryan here that's interesting about those, he says a new person coming in, yeah. right? So I have my signatures on all of those, and I've sat with I've sat with Melissa as we've gone through, and she's got it down to a science now. She knows exactly which ones I'm going to ask about. <laughs> I've gone from asking about ten or twelve to today. We were down to we were down to two on the ones that we we looked at. The Hearst Company now. The yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, why are all these grimaces? I keep with wood, so I don't. Know. There we go. That's great. Big one. Yeah. Uh, School-wide programs deficit of twenty-four thousand. The in the financial. Yeah. So the school-wide programs are the programs that are grant funded, and so looking at that financial, which I didn't spend a lot of time looking at, I really got I really got Robbins. That would mean that. You perhaps spent twenty four thousand dollars more than you had budgeted. I suspect that there is a reimbursement line somewhere else that equals twenty four thousand since it's coming out of a, ultimately a grant. And I know you can't run a deficit in grants. The state won't let you do that. Cool. The, um the food deficit, is that just due to the rising costs or would it be more staffing? Do you have, or are you still figuring that out? I think that's going to, Sarah, be a great thing for Robin to talk about when she's here okay. with you. Okay. I, will, I will not steal all her thunder. All right. Is she scheduled to come next month? So you've it got says central office admin is what yeah. I added, so we have that. Very good. Okay. And financially, if we're closing out the books, that is a good time for her to come and talk about that. Okay. Could you yeah. invite Other for us? Can I what? Invite I only wanted to share, I anticipate a state reimbursement for the universal meals. Mm. Oh, okay. Ah. Uh, Cool. All right. Other questions on financial? All right, then Michael, did you want to specifically talk about each of these other little traffic? quick yeah. items? Okay, so I included, a, I included your bus driver agreement, and it's interesting because you have two and you have, uh, you have committees that negotiate with people. Bus drivers is not a group that you negotiate. It's not a bus driver association. So essentially what you have is an employment agreement 
and some of your employment agreements say policy and some of them say employment agreements. There, which is why in the agenda, the way that I described this had a bunch of dashes after it, because I'm not sure. But what, I, what my experience tells me is that ultimately the board, when we're setting rates for people, every place that I've worked outside of policy governance, the board had a role in that. Uh, and in fact, policy is what drove uh, non-union non -union folks. So, what's happening with the bus driver situation right now is we are currently down two bus drivers. We're going to have to adjust routes next week. Uh, one of those bus drivers is down uh, because they are on a worker's comp situation, and one of the bus drivers we're still working to hire. Having a little bit of a hard time hiring people because our rate is a little bit on the low end and we are not able to offer unemployment during the summer. We are incidentally able to offer employment, employment. over the summer. So yeah. people who are doing the work and want to work have some ability to drive during the summer. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting piece. Uh, I think that in your June meeting, I think Craig came, he would have come today, he had a family commitment. Um, and part of what you all were looking at is what's the overall impact on this proposal on your budget. The overall impact is you're still going to be under budget in the transportation line even if we are able to fill the two vacancies that ha are there right now. Part of that is from the time that you budgeted until today, the routes had changed already and the way that the routes were being delivered made it more efficient so that uh, the cost had gone, gone down. If you go with this proposal, you'll be in a spot where you are competitive. It's important to recognize that bus drivers do not qualify for health insurance. Uh, I think I put it right in here that if you worked out a family plan in an hourly situation, a family plan is worth $20 an hour to our school year employees. Okay. Uh, so I know that the number the number is a little bit on the higher side. Uh, it is competitive with what folks around us are offering, uh, and it sets us up to basically be more or less at a three percent increase for each of the four year three years that follow this reset. Uh, and my understanding, looking at this, is you have had a tradition of trying to look four years out with your bus uh, with your bus agreements so this is what uh, that's what I'm recommending it stays within the financial constraints uh, and we believe that it'll make it so that we will have more success in hiring bus drivers uh, I think the only piece about this that might be missing was uh, Craig was going to propose a maybe some kind of education or professional development uh, to also maybe, I don't know, uh, justify some of these increases? Did he speak to that at all with you? He, uh, in the end, this is where he decided to stay focused, was just on the, okay. just on the salary piece. He was <coughs> trying to make sure that he would be competitive and rather than put expenses in something other than yep. salary, staying here seemed like it made the sense. Piggybacking that question, I'm wondering with um, the work you do in the beginning of the school year before school starts with the staff, are the bus drivers invited to do that, kind of de-escalate situations that may happen on the bus? There is specific training for, for bus drivers that mm -hmm. we're, we're doing this year, uh, particularly around uh, the school safety, the ALICE training. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think we'll find our bus drivers in some other places. Uh, the way that your contracts are or your agreements are, I, I will in the next couple meetings get a better definition. I'll work with Pietro to make sure that what these are called are, they're all called the same thing so that there's not three different names for them. Um, the way that they're written is we allow people to attend trainings 
it's not necessarily written as a requirement. And okay. so um, I think that if we make things compelling and interesting and important for people and express that, we have the ability to bring people in and that's I think probably what's going to happen in this case. I think the other thing that's happened with bus drivers is bus driving has gone from a largely retirement kind of job for people to there are actually people who are this is their primary job and um, so I think those are those are important things for you to consider as you look at this potential change. Other questions? Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity giving you a heads up that uh, there's some things that are changing in the in the schools. The acceptable use policy is it's really a procedure because you all didn't adopt it. Uh, is changing, and in order to comply with the our insurance carrier is looking at some different pieces and things that we need. Probably the most noticeable that you'll hear faculty and staff. Um, well, I mean, do you all like multi-factor authentication when you're doing your banking, oh, right? Yeah. So that same response is what's gonna happen. So multi-factor authentication is one of the big ones. The other big thing is you have a tradition and a culture. We have a tradition and a culture where using computers for your own personal use has been something that's been okay in the Randolph and the Orange Southwest School District. Um, it's really not. Uh, and as I, so I met with the association around this and, and sort of shared, look, I, get, I don't have somebody who's sitting around watching what all people are going to if somebody goes and schedules a doctor's appointment on their UVM my chart yeah that's really not in keeping with the acceptable use policy I'm probably not really paying a lot of attention to that but when you download your stuff on my chart you bring it into the local network and if our network gets hacked and your medical information gets hacked out of it that's on you you didn't follow the acceptable use policy and that's not on that's not on us. So that's kind of the example that I'm looking at. The, you think that teachers and educators and people who work in the systems know, you know, you don't do the other really big pieces, and I don't think we really have that going on, or this is changes in the acceptable use policy don't change that a whole lot. But it is a little bit different in encouraging people to uh, use their cell phones or their own personal devices. Uh, we do have guest networks in all of the buildings that are open and filtered at a level that is appropriate for students. So that's where we are with cybersecurity. Cool. Next. Next is after school programming staffing. Okay. Which Melinda did send out. Oh, yeah. but yes. a parent not in, of not primary wouldn't have gotten it. So. Okay. So what's happening with after school programming is, uh, and telling you this, I know that as a board, this this is a decision for administration to make. Here's a case where I know somebody's going to come up to you and say, we don't think you should do it this way. And so my goal was to get you to be the group that heard about it first. Um, so it's actually Gifford. I might have written Clara Martin in my report. I think it's actually Gifford that was running our after school. Gifford. 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 Yep. Gifford. Great. Yep. <laughs> the uh, after school program um, at RES was run by Gifford. And Gifford uh, let us know at the end of last year that they would not be running the after school program moving forward. Uh, we do not currently have the staffing to staff both a new after school program taking over for Gifford at RES and Braintree. One of the things that's required in running an after school program is that 40% of the director's time has to be on site. If we try to have a director be on three sites, we have to have somebody that can clone themselves and be 120% in places. So what we're looking at doing is uh, Braintree ends its day soon enough that the kids who get on the bus in Braintree can come over to RES and join a after-school program 
at RES um, and not miss out on anything. We also are able to double the size of the after school program at that location. So we have about 30 kids, uh, 30 slots at the current Braintree one. We'll be able to have 60 slots at RES. Uh, I'd say the one thing about this that is maybe the maybe the uh, will be a couple of catching points, but one of those catching points will be people pick up their kids from the after school programs. We don't typically bus kids home from after school. So brain tree parents will need to pick their kids up at RES. Um, and then it's just that, that whole thing about we're not having we're not having the after school program in the building that we have school in during the day. I know that will be hard in, in some cases. The alternative is we don't have after school program for all of the kids in the in the district. So we recognize that there are some challenges with it and uh, we're gonna publish that if we it sounds like we have already put out some of it already. We're it will be widely throughout the district tomorrow. Um, and so uh, the other thing that's going to change a little bit with the after school program is the one that is really more child care oriented currently operates uh, K to 6. It's going to operate K to 4. And we're trying to figure out how to fund the enrichment activities for five and six that took place when we had ESSER funds. Uh, we're sort of in that spot where uh, Heather is doing a lot of great work. We just got our final numbers for our grants and she's having to go through. Those all came back a little bit more than what we had budgeted. So we're trying to figure out, do we have the wiggle room to pull all of this off? And it is incredibly close. So. Uh, we think in the end we're going to get there, uh, but those are those are things that I think potentially could come back to you as a board. People will at least express their their frustrations, and hopefully you'll be able to say, "Hey, this was the creative way that they were able to make sure that all students in K to four still had access to after school programming." Is, it, is there a book that after school program? Nope, they're going to stay. So at Brookfield finishes later, mm -hmm. and so getting them down to the after-school program at this point was not going to work, and so yep. our after-school director will be able to be 40% of their time at RES and 40% of their time up at Brookfield, and that'll make the that'll make that requirement. 20% of their time driving between the two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think probably what they're going to do is they're going to not be, I, I hope that as they arrange their time, I hope that they don't use the time to drive between. I hope that they are one, one day, the other, the others, and then however they split that last 20, one day a week at one or the other. Heather, you mm -hmm. had something? I believe I still see Corey Scopey in, uh, in the background yeah and i'm i'm wondering if the board would permit her to engage in sharing with the difficulty in hiring and uh why it the district this is our best move is to make these changes if the board is willing uh to invite corey i would really love for her to speak i mean i don't have too much more to add than what michael has added um we did find it, or we do have an interested candidate for the director position at um, RES. And so in order to be a director, you need a bachelor's degree. Um, so it's, they're hard to find, you know, for 20 hours a week for $20 an hour, which is really all we can offer. Um, so we do have a grant to run the program at RES because it is new. Um, so grant funding will be paying for that person's salary, salary so we can actually offer more, which is why it is more enticing. Brookfield and Braintree are existing programs and they weren't eligible for this grant because we have been running them as a district for the past probably close to 10 years. Um, so really limited. I mean, I can only offer $17 an hour for staff and a director position is 15 to 20 hours a week with a $2,000 stipend, um, and you're only paid for the time you're with children. You're not paid for your planning, and you're not paid for your time um, doing paperwork. So it is not, um, 
it's hard to find. Um, so this, um, so in Brookfield, I currently have myself and one other person. Um, so I just want to be clear that staffing is also unstable. <laughs> you know, there could be like we are going to run it, but you know, you're you're one call out away from you know having to to close the state of um, child care. Not that I call it child care, but. Um, so yeah, so this seemed like our best option. Um, the other question about Brookfield, which we haven't figured out yet, is, and this is an admin question, administration needs to figure out, is do we just run at K-4, or do we run at K-6? Because then you get into an equity piece. So I think we're still sort of trying to um, figure that out. Um, and the other thing to think about RES is your capacity is 60. Um, after school programs are licensed through the state child care system, um, Department of Children and Families. We're licensed for 60. I have you have to have five people working every day to take 60. Um, I think 60 is our goal. Um, I think realistically at this point we're looking at probably 50 per day. Um, but 60 is the goal. We will continue to advertise. We will continue to try to hire um, paraprofessionals. Um, are always you know they can work a couple days a week. They can't go over 40 hours a week. So that also gets tricky. You do sometimes have people who are willing to work more, but they can't work more than two days two full days a week in the program. Um, so that seemed like combining Braintree and Brookfield, or Braintree and Randolph logistically with busing made sense. And Brookfield just, we just can't get, get them there at a reasonable time, so. And just in case you didn't know, Corey is oh, yeah. one I'm of the, the after people. Director. He's an after school director. <laughs> yeah, just so, so that you I, understand the context I of. The, I've spent the past year um, overseeing the after school programming and also being the director at Brookfield because we were unable to find a director at all of last year. We were very lucky to have a director at Braintree. However, she has moved on to take a position, a full-time position at the tech center, so she will not be um, working with us again in after school this year. So. In general, Thank you so much, Corey, for sharing that need because Corey is at the administrator level of all three programs. Um, and by her sharing the need, I just wanted you to see um, that OSSD would not make this change lightly, and it's based on uh, staffing and restraints and our sincere desire to provide the best we can for all students. It, yeah, just the the K through four or K yeah. through six thing, just from personal experience, it does seem like the, the bulk of ASP kids are yeah. the younger, yeah. so it, I mean, it, it not. It's still it, after school care is very important for parents of fifth and sixth graders. I don't mean to diminish it at all, but it the bulk of them are younger, yeah. right? Yeah, I would okay. say two thirds of each program is is K through four, which is kind of why we looked at that as yeah. being a higher need age group for after school programming for sure. Um, also, this grant we received, um, we wrote it originally to fund a middle school program. Uh, back before RES, when RES was run by Gifford. Um, so we were able to make some tweaks. Um, so it would fund a new program at RES for K-4, and we could do some fifth and sixth grade programming, more like club programming at the high school. They, um, or middle high school, they, the grant writers from this, or the grant readers from the state liked the fact that we were bringing fifth and sixth graders from all three elementary schools together prior to the middle school and trying to develop relationships, you know, getting to know each other, getting to know the school, their teachers. Um, so we're hopeful, um, you know, logistically, that's a question, you know, Lisa and I and others will have to figure out about how that will look, but we hope to have either clubs, um, um, you know, during the school year or maybe on half days doing some field trips all together and being able to offer some fun activities for middle, those, that middle school age group to kind of get together, so. Cool. So that was another reason for the logistics. So yes, um, I think you know Brookfield would probably have about ten, you know, in that K six range. Um, so probably about the same at every building. So all kinds of moving parts with it, and like I said, I'm sure that you'll hear you hear something, and at least you have some information now, so that it's and not coming blindly your way. Yeah. And who do you want us to, you know, sometimes people. I might not remember everything. Who, do you want me to direct them to Corey as the administrator of the after school programs? Or do you want us Make to life really easy for board members. Send people <laughs> send, send right people to, to okay. me. Yep. Okay. 
Thank you for asking that. Yeah, that's I just want to say I think it's incredible that in such a short amount of time you were able to come up with a yeah. even possibility. Um, I remember getting the letter and just being kind of panicked. Um, so from Robin's nest. From Robin's yeah. nest. Yeah, and so I think you know I have a first grader who absolutely cannot be home by herself. I have a sixth grader who, with sort of creative thinking in our neighbors, is going to be able to be at home. Um, so this actually means I'm able to maintain employment. And I think there's a lot of families in the district that that, um, it provides that stability. So I just want to say thank you for mm -hmm. the incredible heavy lift. Big shout goodness. out to these guys. So it was yep. the, the principals, Heather, Corey, I don't know who else I'm missing on that, that really put their put their heads together and said what can we do and so and did it so appreciate that and the other thing too is it doesn't have to be permanent right we, we will continue to advertise and if we are able to find staff for braintree we can reopen it's not you know it's not a decision you have to make at the beginning of the school year and say we're done for the whole 24 25 you know if we are able to reopen we certainly can yeah we got to look at the funding too the, yeah. the funding is the funding is turning out to be just as challenging as the staffing Seems like a lot of hurdles. And there are a lot of hurdles, so I'm glad that we've got I've we got most of the way most of the way through. We know it's not perfect. We do know that it's something that we will continue to look at more funding and more staffing. Um, somebody taught me long ago, don't let don't let good be their perfect be the software of good. good or, right. Yeah, something <clears throat> like that. Is this do parents pay for this or is this a they do. I think they pay, as I understand it. Corey's going to know these numbers better than me, but we'll see how good, how well I've done this. Yeah. I thought so this I think was it's actually not a budget line for us. That this was completely separate from our school it is. budget. Yeah. yeah, it is. But it's funded out of. In the event that we don't fund it individually or grants, it will cost. And so there's the to maintain it. Then it would have to be put into the school budget. Then but would, then if you put it in the school budget, it has to be open to everyone who wants it. There's you can't you can't you can't exclude kids because we're at capacity right like I think you can you can create a lottery and things like that so there's there's different it would pieces. be a crappy thing to do it would be a crappy <laughs> thing to do right so so uh, I think to answer the question it was eleven dollars for the first child 16 for two close ah. close you're really close it's 15 for child 11 if you have any additional children Oh, per day. Man. So it works out. I choose his. I misunderstood. Yeah. So I thought I didn't remember. It's like misunderstood. <laughs> it's confusing. It's confusing. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. For sitting through the whole meeting. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, action item, a uh, few things. I'm going to email Ms. Fish uh, and invite her to our special meeting next Thursday, 6 p.m. It will be Thanks, Dr. Fish. Dr. Fish, I thank you. So. Thank you. Um, let's see, I have some work to do on the annual agenda. Uh, and the ENDS committee needs to schedule a meeting. Other action items? Uh, I research all the boards incorporate in students. Right, yes. yes. And ongoing, yes. Thank you. Morning for the special meeting. Say it again. Yeah, the morning, morning for the special meeting. Morning for the special meeting. Thank you. Do you want to stick around for a couple of seconds after this meeting and just pick a date? Schedule and ends. I yeah. got my phone. Oh, we don't have schedules in front of us. Oh, okay. Okay. Neither do you don't have your phone. Oh, you have I a paper am calendar. Here. Um, is there need for executive session? Oops. For anyone? Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then um, do we have any decision about the bus thing? No. Okay. Right? That's that's, that's something he signs. So yeah. I'm I'm taking it that I've told you what I'm gonna do. If you didn't want me to do that, you would have said something. And if later I find out that I needed an affirmative positive from you from Pietro, I'll come back. Yeah, at the moment, I'm going to operate under the belief that I can do it because I'm following. You're you know, within your executive limitations. It's been delegated to him. Through yep. The cool. Then um, I'm oh, calling. What's that? There was something I wanted to comment on the bus driver agreement about. 
the health care, the mm -hmm. employment during summer. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Can you catch up with me at the end? Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion to yeah, I adjourn. I can't remember what it was now. I move to adjourn. Great. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Sarah. We are adjourned at 851.